I'm sorry. It's not your fault. It's Bryce's fault. <laughs> I do want to make that joke. <laughs> Snapping people in half. <laughs> we have. <laughs> it wasn't really that hard of a choke slam. I'm Well, here's the good thing. No one else, no one watched them. Half the people in here that need to watch them don't even watch them, so. And people that did watch it probably don't stay listening long enough to get to the good parts, so. I did tell us all that. Um, so the last thing that we're doing in this section is, uh, Dealing with complex numbers, and why are we doing all these weird things in this chapter? Because they all have to do with trig, and we love trig this semester. So um, the first part of it is not so bad. It's kind of weird because instead of talking about the x-axis and the y-axis, we're going to talk about taking a complex number, a plus bi, and graphing it where this is the real axis and this is the imaginary axis. In second hour today, someone said, so that axis really isn't there. No, imaginary does not mean invisible. So... Keep those separate. You guys think of your imaginary friends as children, and you think that means invisible, but they're not invisible. Even though someone in Algebra 2 once used to call them invisible numbers, they're not invisible. They are imaginary. But what if I graph the point here, like 2, 3? Yeah. Mm, we're going to connect. Right. This is not polar graphs. This is now imaginary and real, gra real lines. And uh, we're going to connect back to the polar stuff in a minute, though. So it's going to all come together at some point. Colin Berry might have had the best quote of the day today and said, this is the most pointless thing we've done all year. So <laughs> just so you had you something to look forward to. So. <laughs> There's a point. We're just not there yet. We're just baby steps to get to where we're going. Uh, but if this is two on the real axis and three on the imaginary axis, this would be the same as saying the complex number is two plus three i. Because the two is the real part, the three comes from the imaginary part. You with me on that? So A is the real part. A is the real part of the complex number. B is the complex part. B I is the complex part. So what if I graph a negative number like this? What if I graph this point, which would be negative three, negative two? What would be the complex number that goes with that point? origin to that point that we just graphed. And we, we write it like this. The absolute value of A plus BI, also known as the modulus. I feel like this chapter is full of ridiculous vocabulary that you're never going to use again your whole life. But, you know, what else are you going to do with April free calculus? Just have learned ridiculous things and you're never going to use again. There's actually some electric engineering stuff that uses imaginary numbers with vectors. Um, it's the only place really that I've ever seen imaginary numbers outside of math class. Um, and you might think, how can there be imaginary numbers if you're working with electrical engineering? I don't know, but it's cool. That's why we learn about them, just for those people. Um, here's what's really cool about this. Maybe not so cool. But if I want to know the distance from here to here, do you agree that we could kind of think about a triangle like we've been doing? Like if I drew this in like this... <laughs> Then this is your imaginary part, this is your real part. So how do you think we can find that link? Just Pythagorean theorem. So we can say to find the modulus, it's just the square root of a squared plus b squared. I don't really know why I have another equal sign there, but. The nice thing is that A and B, the only reason we're using A and B instead of X and Y is because it's in this format. But you could, if you just know the, the complex number, you can find that distance without ever graphing it. I mean, it's fine to graph it, but you can.
can find that, that distance there. So sometimes they're going to say find this and ask the value. Sometimes they might say find the modulus, and that just means you have to divide it by. With me so far? Kind of weird, but not impossible. performing in the talent show tonight? <laughs> Top secret, I think. <laughs> Is there going to be a whole lot of ridiculousness going on talent show tonight? <laughs> I don't know. I'm debating, but I don't really... The, they should let all the high school people go first, and then I can go home. <laughs> so that you know when to, yeah, to show up. Like, I don't really care about the middle school. No offense to them, but I don't know them. Yeah, I think there should be a middle school talent show and a high school talent show. And find the absolute value of 4 minus 2i. That means find the distance from here to here. But I just know that's going to be the square root of a square. Sorry, that's uh, that is my word. The square root of 4 squared plus the square root of negative 2 squared. Some people were trying to put i in there. We don't actually put i when we're finding the distance. We're just taking a and b. So we would get 16 plus 4, which is the square root of 20. I don't want decimals. We could break that up as a square root of 4 times the square root of 5. Or that would be a distance of 2 square root of 5. Right? Just a Pythagorean theorem. We decided in the second hour today that most math we can do by drawing a triangle. Because everything seems to come back to the Pythagorean theorem. Most trade comes back to the Pythagorean theorem. Yes? So how can we make this more exciting? Let's tie it into trig. So what we want to do is we call this standard form of a complex number, a plus bi. We want to write it in trig form, which means we want to add some thetas in there. Trig form of a complex number. And today it does seem kind of pointless. I feel I feel like most of you would say every day, every day is pointless in here, so I don't know why I try to uh, tell you differently. But we're spending three days on this. And the final day in here, we're going to solve equations that have complex answers, and we're going to use trig to solve those and expand those. And so you have to understand this before you can do those things that actually help us. Um, so Monday, I feel like I'm going to show you a reason why this is better, why it's better to know this than to actually have to work it all out. So, but today is just, you know, pointless, I guess. It's just, it's hard in math sometimes for you to see the end picture of, we're doing this because, like, I, like what if I told you to do this? 3 plus 4i to the 15th power, one option would be you could write this out 15 times and you could work it out, right? That's not a good option. Another option we learned this year, remember when we did Pascal's Triangle and we worked things out, and you have, you'd have to go to the 16th row of Pascal's Triangle, that'd still be a lot of work, right? Well, there's another way that if we could write this in trig form, there's a formula that we can do this pretty quickly uh, to work that out. So that's kind of like the one reason that you can learn this is it helps you work out problems that look really ugly like that. Um, and the other reason is we can solve equations this way. So it's just hard sometimes on day one of something for me to show you the reason behind it. I'm just going to draw another point over here. I just wrote it in gray here, but there was actually a point. 
and I'm going to call that A and B. That could easily be X and Y. We're just kind of substituting A and B for X and Y because of the A plus B I. No real new things today. It's just changing X and Y to A and B. And again, we could draw in our little triangle, and we could say that this is Y, and we could say that this is X. Uh, Philip wanted me to say that that's negative X, and you're right, in quadrant two it would be negative, but I'm just trying to draw a generic triangle right now. And if we talked about this being theta, do you agree we could relate the sides of this using trig? And so let's see if you, oh, why did I call that X and Y? Sometimes they touch X and Y on the end. X and Y, or A and B. So let's see if you guys get this right. Second hour had the wrong answer here because they told me that it was an opinion, but I told them they were wrong. What do you think we should call this red line here? <laughs> C is okay. I just like R for radius. Um, like thinking of the radius there. Um, but if you use C, that's okay. But I'm using R. Uh, so if I wanted you to find the cosine of this angle using A, B, and R instead of X, Y, and R, what would the cosine of theta be? Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse or A over R. Normally we think of like X over R, right? And if I wanted to solve this for A, do you agree that that would become R cosine of theta? A equals R cosine theta. Does that sound vaguely familiar to polar things? X equals R cosine theta? Yeah. Same thing for this one. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse or B over R. Sine is Y over R. Multiply R over and we could say that B equals R sine of theta instead of y equals r sine of theta. So here's what trig form is. Standard form is this, b equals a plus bi. This is standard form. I want trig form, which means I want to replace a and b with r's and thetas. So if I know that a and b equal this, can I replace a and b with r cosine theta and r sine of theta? So I can say r cosine theta plus r sine of theta with an i out there. Can I factor an r out of that? And so I could say r times cosine of theta, and I like to put the i in the front, just because I find it weird to put an i behind theta. <coughs> That is trig form of a complex number. Every time, could you do this work to get it? Yes. But the idea is, once you do this a few times, you're just going to remember that. Because this is really using what we learned about polar equation, this is also known as polar form. So we could say a.k.a. polar form. Some other information that you might need that you could get from this triangle, you don't have to write this down because you can get all of it, but we could say we already know that r squared equals a squared plus b squared, or r equals the square root of a squared plus b squared. If you wanted to, we could say that tangent, or any of the trig functions, but tangent would be opposite over adjacent. So instead of y over x, we would say b over a. I don't know that you need that, but at some point, you know, it might come in handy. So really the big focus today, besides finding the distance there, that the modulus, is we want to go from standard form to trig form and from trig form to standard form. Um, and so we're just going to practice doing that, and then we'll be done.
So you don't have to graph this one, but I'm going to do it just so you can see. But uh, if this is 2 plus 2i, do you agree that I know what a and b are? I know that a is 2, I know that b is 2. That means I know that it's in quadrant 1, because it would be like 2, 2, which means it would be this point right here. 2, 2. Follow me on that? Quadrant 2, base of 2. We find R if we know what A and B are. Yes. We say that R equals the square root of A squared plus B squared, which would be 4 plus 4, which would be the square root of 8, which would be 2 square root of 2. I need an R, I need a theta. You can use whatever trig function you want to find theta. Um, some people, especially with the unit circle stuff, are going to be able to tell what theta is just by looking at it. Like looking at this triangle, if the sides are the same, do you know what angle that has to be? It's pi fourths. Uh, quadrant one, the only one that could have the sides the same would be pi fourths. If you didn't know that, what if we just did sine or cosine or tangent? It doesn't matter here. Uh, if I did cosine, Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. I would get 2 over 2 square root of 2. The two cancel. And I'd get square root of 2 over 2. And so I would ask myself, where does cosine equal square root of 2 over 2 in quadrant 1? Oh, theta has to be pi fourths. If you can tell that theta is pi fourths without having to do that work, I'm okay with that. Like, I hope that we're kind of there, especially with pi fourths. Some of the other ones, maybe not. You with me on that? So why do I need R and why do I need theta? Because standard form is this. Trig form is changing it to R times cosine of theta plus I sine of theta. So if I know R and I know theta, all I'm doing is plugging them into that form. So I would say that the trig form of this would be 2 radical 2 times the cosine of pi fourths plus i times the sine of pi fourths. That's trig form. Kind of seems pointless today, but I promise there's really a, a, a use for it in math later on. Um, what do you think would happen if you worked this out? Like if you found the cosine of pi fourths and multiplied by 2 radical 2, and you found the sine of pi fourths and you multiplied by 2 radical 2, guess what you'd get? taking this and we're just rewriting it using trig, but it, it's the exact same value. That's why the i is still in it. So that's when Colin informed me that this was the most pointless thing we've ever done, but there's a reason for it later. Okay, so this is trig form. Questions about that? I think sometimes they're easier than others. So let's look at one more that maybe will kind of click together for you there, and then we'll go the other way, and then I'll be done. I have two more examples. Tell me this one. What is A on this one? It just says 4i. Could you rewrite this as 0 plus 4i if you wanted? And again, you don't have to graph it, but sometimes the graph helps you see uh, the angle or helps you see r. Yeah, like if we go to 0 on the real axis and 4 on the imaginary axis, you agree it's just a dot right here? Which is why I like to think of the graph sometimes, because can you tell me what theta has to be if that's where my dot is? Pi halves. You with me on that? If you didn't see that, you could still work it out. Like, we could still do the trig stuff here. But we can look at the graph and know that that's at pi halves. What about r on this one? Do you know what r is or how we defined r? Or... Now we can still do the square root of a squared plus b squared, but also remember that this is the distance. How far is it from the origin to that point? It should be at 4 here, but if we if we do this, we, we're going to be at 0 plus 16, and we're still going to get a because we didn't realize that. 
right? So if you only have A or you only have B, you're always going to be on one of these, uh, like on the axis of zero or pi halves or three pi halves. The distance is just a straight line there. Like you don't have to do Pythagorean theorem necessarily. It still works, but I just like to show you that you don't have to do that so much. And if I know theta and I know r, I can write the answer. 4i is the same as saying 4 times the cosine of theta plus i sine of theta, which is pi halves. It's easy to check that you did this right. The cosine of pi halves is 0. We were times 4 is 0. The sine of pi halves is 1. 1 times 4 is 4. So that is the true free form of that. Me on that. The other one is going the other way. And honestly, I think going from trig form back to standard form is easier because all you have to do is work it out. They gave you this and they said write this in standard form. You just work it out. So standard form means get it back in A plus B I form. Again, if this is in your unit circle, I expect that you can give me exact answers. No decimals. If the angle is not in our unit circle, then the only way you could do it would be to actually get a decimal. But um, that's the only time I would want a decimal. So 225 degrees, is that in my unit circle? I think that's uh, 5 pi fourths, right? 180 plus 45. Which means you should be able to tell me the ordered pair there or draw a triangle there. Aaron today, when I did this, kept saying, how do you get them? How are you getting them? Like, I don't know. It's our unit circle. Like, I don't know how to explain that at this point. Right? Negative radical 2 over 2, negative radical 3 over 2. Because that's the point at 5 by 4. Which means all you have to do is plug that in and multiply it out. So 1 fourth times the cosine of 225. The cosine of 225 is negative radical 2 over 2 times the sine of 225, which is also negative radical 2 over 2. And you just simplify it. Actually, I think I might have. Work this out. Um, multiply across the top, across the bottom. So that's negative radical 2 over 8. So the negative, um, I, don't, I, I don't know where you want to put the i. Negative radical 2 over 8. You can put the i out here. You can put the i in front of the radical. Just don't forget your i. I uh, really want to cancel stuff out there because they see a 2 and an 8 and they just really want to cancel. But remember, you can't cross something out in the radical that's not in the radical. Um, so I would just leave it. If you wanted to write it all as one fraction, you could. It already has a common denominator. But again, you can't simplify it. So I just always leave my answer like this. Questions? Questions about that? So the last one is just like this. I just want to make sure that you can do this. And two pi thirds, you've got to find a point for that. Um, but work this out and see if you can give me an answer. You can do it on your paper, you can do it on your whiteboard, and then I'll give you some homework, and you'll actually have some time to work on it even after my rant about bread. Better hope I'm a little less angry on Monday. She might get a new front row seat for the rest of the year. Over here, right? This is where we're trying to find two by fours.
So this is negative one half square root of three over two, right? Is that true? This one, isn't it start with one half radical three over two on this side? So it's the same, it's just negative one. All the pi thirds are the same, just change the sign. So cosine of two pi thirds is negative one half. And the sine of two pi thirds is radical three over two. So we could multiply that in and ten over two is five, so it's negative five plus um, five i radical three. Where do you put the i? I don't care. I always put it after the number before the radical, but as long as it's in there, don't be super messy. Like, don't make a crazy radical that goes on forever and then put your i underneath it and then you mark it wrong. That's why I put it in front of the radical. But make sure you're using your unit circle correctly. Okay? Not the best thing. Not even a lot of homework today. This is, I'm calling this, oh, and then six, six, day two, and I'm not just calling you that. Six, six, day one, there are three days of six, six, which means I think that puts us at starting, taking our test either next Friday or the following Monday. Um, no. Uh, well, we're going to do something else. We still have like three weeks after that, kids. We're not going to review the final for three weeks. No. We are not reviewing for three weeks. We will review for three days. Three days. Maybe four. Three days. First of all, finals will be Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of the last week. I don't know. There'll be a little, like, you will, you might end up taking your finals the same day in here that the other kids do. It just depends on what day. Because the only day that you won't take finals that everyone else takes finals will be Friday. So you'll take finals on Wednesday and Thursday just like everyone else. The only day you won't take it is Friday because you'll do graduation practice on Friday. So you only get out one day early. So whatever finals are on Friday, you will take before then. But usually on Friday, Five and seven are on Friday because they make you take finals the last two periods of the day, which I think that means six hours final you won't take early. Like, you'll probably take it in here with anyone else. But, I don't know. We have a meeting next week or something that I'm sure will give us the schedule. Take all the finals. They have a project and a final.